All right. What's up, man? Hi. Congratulations. It's a fantastic film. I'm a member of the DGA, and I've never been in this building before. I live in Texas, so I don't get to come to any screenings. So this is it's a weird perspective to be seeing it from. Um, so why don't you... I'll start with like some boring questions. Sure. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about like how the idea came to you? Like, did you when when you finished Mud, did you have this script? Did you have an idea? What's how how did it sort of start? When did it come along in your career? And yeah, so uh, I had this idea back when I was thinking about Take Shelter. So, um, and when I say idea, just you know the kernels of it. Um, when I was making Take Shelter, I was struck by this idea of a, a man standing in my backyard over a storm shelter with two open storm doors. Um, and very similarly, I think it was within within that same month, I was struck by this idea of these two guys in a souped-up car moving fast through dark roads um, in the American South in the middle of the night. Um, I had it connected to nothing. It wasn't connected to a boy with superpowers or even the sci-fi genre. It was just this image of these guys. And that that came first, um, and oddly enough, I quickly applied the title Midnight Special, which had no significance um, <laughs> whatsoever, other than I thought it just sounded cool. And um, and it started to feel like um, a genre film. I knew I wanted to make a, a film that was um, weighted more on the, the genre side of things. With Take Shelter, I'd really been struck by this idea of making an art house genre film. Um, and, and I knew that this one... Um, would be weighted more toward the genre. So, you know, it, it's it started like that. But when I when I write, I always um, I always start on on two tracks at once. You've got this plot track, um, which is all the genre elements and just all the details. Um, but then there's this bigger thematic idea that I try and attach things to, and that's where the movies really start to become something. You know. Um, I can get pretty far along, actually, in a film like this into the chase without knowing what's going on, uh, why, I'm, why I'm bothering anybody with this story. Right. And that's when I started thinking about my life, and I was in my first year of fatherhood, and that's when the, that's when the thing really started to take shape. That's, I mean, it's really interesting because when you look at Take Shelter and you look at this film, they both have such, they work as allegory in such strong ways that it's really interesting to me that it just started with an image. At what point does the sort of metaphorical significance enter into it? And then how strongly do you, ad how strongly is that a guideline for you? How strongly do you adhere to it? Because they seem to me, both of those, less than less than Mud actually, but I, more than Mud actually, feel like very much stories about, um, you know, well, Take Shirtler's obviously about anxiety. Right. Um, and this to me, it has such strong allegorical significance as well, so. Um, when the thought occurs, uh, then it reinforms everything, you know. But I don't, I don't um, like typing into a computer. Like writing in Final Draft is is definitely the last step, you know. Uh, I heavily outline these things, and so I can again, I can get pretty far into the plot, and still, and it still feels fairly malleable. Um, and uh, for this film, I'll just get real specific about it. A about eight months in uh, to my son's life, he had a febrile seizure, uh, which is the body's reaction to a spike in fever. And although it has no long-lasting effects, uh, it was terrifying for my wife and I. And, you know, we were just talking about the first year of fatherhood. You're, you're kind of, you know, you're sleep-deprived. Your social life is changing. Everything's, it's a whole sea change in your life. And this event just woke me up um, to the very real possibility that my son could die. And, uh, and I, I was racked with fear from that. And... I'd, I'd done enough with the other films to know that fear is a great catalyst for, for starting to conceive of a, of a theme or an idea. Take Shelter is all about fear, but fear is not like a point in and of itself. You know, uh, fear is not what the movie's about. The movie's about commitment and marriage and communication within marriage. And so I knew I had the fear, but I didn't know what the thought was. Right. And so I just started to think about, well, if I can't control whether or not my son dies. If I have no control over his environment, if I really don't have any control over who he grows up to be, why am I here? What, what am I doing? And it, and it seemed like as a, as a parent, it's our job to just constantly define 
who our kids are um, for themselves. Who, who, what's their nature? Who, who are they really? Don't project my point of view onto it. Just try and understand who they are. And as they grow up, redefine that and help them understand it. And so that all of a sudden gave purpose to Mike Shannon's character in this movie in a very real way. It felt like an allegory for parenthood. You don't know what your child is, but you're, you're desperately trying to find out before something terrible happens to them. <laughs> that's really, I have a six month old kid and that's really interesting. And now I'm really scared yeah. about Sorry. this. <laughs> Thanks. It's going to be fine. <laughs> um, well, all right. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, since we have directors here, let's, let's talk a little bit about your, um, your visual approach. Like, so to me, um, you know, when you're talking about a genre film, this is like so many of the genre elements are handled so beautifully here. Um, from the action sequences to the CG. Um, so, do you do you, do you do you like take your production designer and DP who you've worked with a lot and do you watch genre movies? Do you do you talk about do you reference genre movies? Is it like I reference them question? early on. I mean, yep. I remember in Take Shelter, my production designer, who was my production designer here, his name's Chad Keith. He's amazing. Uh, he came to me and said, "Do you like the bedroom set in his bedroom?" I was like, "Yeah, it looks good, man. It looks good." He's like, "No, do you like it?" I, it looks totally appropriate. And he's like, it's the exact same bedroom set that Richard Dreyfus had in his house in Close Encounters. <laughs> I was like, that's great, man. Um, I, that's, that's interesting. Uh, you know, like, I, I don't ever, um, once I establish the genre, there aren't too many one to one comparisons, especially at the script phase. It's not like I, I say, in Starman, this is where the gas station blows up, and this is where my gas station's going to blow up, even though I did. Blow up a gas station. Um, the, I think we definitely talked about Starman. We definitely talked about Close Encounters. We talked less about E.T. Um, but really, it just comes from... It, I think it comes from an aesthetic approach. And I, I don't know Steven Spielberg. I don't know John Carpenter. But you can look at those films and you see... Uh, especially if you look at the front half of Close Encounters... Like the portrayals of suburban American life in the 70s, I thought was extraordinarily accurate in those films. It felt cluttered. It felt like split-level homes with garages in front. It just felt like he was going to places that looked like the places I grew up. Well, very similar approaches here. You know, we just try to ground ourselves, uh, this, you know, silly sci-fi chase movie idea, just try and ground it as much as we can. Um, and then aesthetically, we you know, we shoot on film. I've, I've been really fortunate to, to be able to shoot all my projects on film. And, you know, we did a test. So we knew that we wanted to ground the effects from the boy's eyes into, into reality the same way we would ground, you know, the cars or the clothes or the motels or anything else. And I was really worried about when you flip the camera around and here's this boy supposedly acting with his glowing eyes, how would that light be represented on the other actor's faces well, like well do we just have a guy with a light you know standing next to the camera I was like well but they need to be looking at this boy's eyes or not looking at his eyes depending on how bright they are and so we quickly came around to the idea of well let's attach light to the boy um and it was really just an effort to to help the other actors but these guys came up with these with this goggle rig, not just the swimming goggles. It was actually separate from that as well. And they put these extraordinarily bright LED lights on the front of them, ran a wire down his back to a 9-volt battery and a dimmer switch. And, um, and when we were doing our film versus digital test early on, because we knew there was so much night photography that any sane person would shoot this on the Alexa, you know. Um, it, it just made sense. And... Um, but we were in a motel room, and we got uh, a kid, and we put this thing on him. And, you know, Panavision has been really, really good to me. And we were using the G-Series lenses, which I used on mud, and I was very familiar with them. They're old, but not too old. They're, they're, this, they're this perfect kind of mid-range lens. And as soon as we got the tests back, testing this, you know, eye rig, um, there was just no, there was no comparison. One looked like the movies we loved, and one looked really beautiful, but it was just too crisp. It was it was too sharp. So I think that was a pretty big aesthetic choice that put us in line with those movies, you know, that we loved. It wasn't. I uh, the cheesiest thing we did was we there's a you know the Vantage Blue filter, which is this, that blue grid filter, which is what they used in Starman 
on occasion we would use those when the boy's eyes needed to go insane. But you know, like 80% of those flares that you see, those are all those are all in camera. We were trying to, you know, ground all that, but I think that's what I think that aesthetic choice along with the million other choices you make in terms of, you know, lighting and wardrobe and, and set design and everything else, that kind of it's just baked into who we were as people. You know? Do you uh shot list? Um I do. I do. Um so do you know the whole do you sit down with your DP and go through everything? Do you tell your DP? Do you I don't, talk about I don't it together? Talk with my DP about it. No, we we've worked on all the films together and um inevitably at some point you get behind during production and every night the night before I'm doing a shot list. On this film because there were, you know, action sequences and things that I'd never dealt with before. Um I had a great storyboard artist uh, out of Austin actually. He works with Rodriguez and uh, this guy named Mark Baird. So he did storyboards for me. And yeah, I can I can sit down. I I dream this stuff, you know. So I can sit down and do do panels um when I need to as long as I know what the location is. Um it always seems I could sit down and do storyboards for the whole movie, you know, b- before we've done any scouting, but it's superfluous until you find where the door is and you know, where the bathroom is and all that stuff. But um but typically what I do on days that don't involve, you know, action sequences or something, I just do a, a very simple shot list and I'll I'll sit and read the scene and and think about I just kind of watch it in my mind and and um you know, it's like shot one A medium uh, dolly and I just write a short description of what the movement is. And at that point, I've seen all the locations, hopefully, and um, and yeah, it it usually st- we stick to that pretty pretty close. And do you have like a set of aesthetic rules that you and your DP agree upon? You know, I noticed there was no handheld. I I could tell, right? There There's was very little. Yeah. Um, I've never I've never been a big fan of it. Um, but that's all. I mean, that's all about camera movement and and my you know backwoods philosophy that I've been developing about directing you know since shotgun stories which is uh i think all camera movement says something i I think it it all speaks about point of view and and unmotivated camera movement um you better have a pretty damn good reason to do it is is my thinking and if the reason why we shoot on film is because it's an organic format that i think really represents kind of the way we see the world it's the same with camera movement like like handheld camera just doesn't really represent the human eye very well right. um i think steady cam's better but it can give itself away too you know um if it, if it's not tied to something i always talk to my steady cam operator about like yeah you know like there's a rope tied around you and the actor and like he moves you move you don't move without him um now of course you break you break all those rules sure um plenty of times um there's an unmotivated dolly move in the gas station scene when you reveal the stuff in the sky but that seems motivated by giant, you know, balls of fire falling out of the sky. So, um, but yeah, I have rules. I have rules when I write, and I have and I have rules when I direct. And it's I just try to always ask myself. Um, well, in Mud, for instance, Mud was entirely, except for like three scenes, from the point of view of the boy. So that was very easy. Um, as a director, you just say, "Where's the boy?" and and that that's where the camera goes. You know. Um, it, it starts to affect height and everything else. Um, it was just a, it, it was actually a really good film um, to be my first film with a steady cam because I'd never used one before because it, it just helped me anchor it, you know, to something and anchor it to point of view. Midnight Special was the first film where that point of view could shift within a scene, so that at some point you're Joel Edgerton's point of view in the car, and then another, at another part in the scene you're the boy's point of view. So the cameras. Not in the front seat, it's in the back seat. I mean, we spent so much time in these damn cars, and it's because you couldn't just get one shot. Um, not to have the scene really, you know, move around the way it, the way it needed to. So it really, for me, it all just comes from point of view, and and you just look at the beats in the scene and say, whose whose point of view is this, and that starts to tell you where the camera goes. Um, let's talk a little bit about your actors. This this young man is phenomenal. Where did you find him? How did you get this performance out of him yeah he came from caa um which yeah uh you know <laughs> that's so much less interesting than so, i thought it's so not it interesting be. um you know making mud um we 
we did the thing where we cast the net and we found these boys that could have come out of the woods, you know, and I think that was very important for that film. I'm not too keen on, on child actors. Um, usually they've, usually they, they're too damn smart and they, they're, they're performing for you and whatever natural, you know, ability that a child has, they've, they've just had it beaten out of them. Um, and so, I mean, we did the same thing with this. I mean, we, I saw thousands of kids across Texas and the Southeast and, um, and they kept sending me this kid and Francine Maisler, who's incredible. Our casting director um, kept saying like, you should really look at this kid. And of course this boy couldn't be any different than the boys from mud. Um, I mean, this is a weird alien kid. And the part of the script that I was most worried about was when he becomes aware. Um, Cause that you can't like, you can't fake that. Um, you can't fake, um, it's not even the lines. It's in between the lines, just kind of this knowing look. And and when I met Jaden, he came in and he had that. He had that built in. He wasn't performing. He wasn't tap dancing for me. He just was very aware of the situation he was in when we were talking. And that proved true on set, too. You know, like he he was very respectful of where he was at, which is not a kid thing. I mean, that's the weird child actor thing. But in this particular instance, we used it to our advantage. You know, I, I would not... And I love Jaden, and I, I think he's going to have an amazing career. I would not have put him in mud, you know. How old is he? He's thirteen now. He was eleven when we were doing this, wow. playing an eight-year-old. But he's very small for his for his size. And so, and what I mean, in like in in a in a scene like if you're not getting what you need out of him, or to or even if you're just have to get him in the headspace to to really. Um, nail the scene like are you in constant dialogue with him do you talk i mean i would imagine you talk to him more than you talk to michael shannon for example well, we don't talk at all you know uh mike and i uh <laughs> the we never have um and and jane and i wouldn't talk the only time he's so polite he's such a sweet kid the only time i had any trouble whatsoever was just getting him to yell just be loud because mm-hmm. he's so soft-spoken and he's so sweet you know, there were these times where he needed to scream and yell, and and he'd be like, ah, and, and okay, your your eyes are bleeding out of your head, ah, um, <clears throat> and in fact, we we ended up uh, calling him back in because visually he would make these pained faces, but they're just he just didn't want to yell. So I got him in a room and we just yeah, I just made him yell and scream, uh, and a lot of that had to get kind of laid in over certain parts. But um, that was really that was really it. I got it. I know it sounds crazy, but every other time he just came, he knew what was going on. He was like, "Where would you like me to stand?" He would tell him, and and he would do it. But I think when you've cast somebody appropriately, yeah. and that goes for adult actors as well. And if I think this is gonna sound like I'm bragging, but I think if you if you've written the behavior inside the script to lay down, um, it just takes care of so much. I remember McConaughey on Mud coming up to me and he was like you know what's great about your script he's like we don't we don't have to fix it we don't have to change anything and i think he was so used to going on the films and and you know being like well the idea is there but you know we'll fix it when we get there but but i try and really track character behavior through these scenes and that seems to help it seems to simplify the conversations with with the actors you know because we're not sitting around going like well why would you do that you know that kind of takes care of itself not always but a lot of the time did you uh, did you know you wanted Shannon to be in this from the beginning? Yeah, that was the deal. When I walked in the front door at Warner Brothers, um, you know there were a few few key things, and he was one of them. So I I was able to work with Shannon. So uh, here's my question. First of all, he's like I think one of our greatest living actors. He's he's absolutely amazing. My when when he was on my set, I was always like, oh no, he looks really mad, you know. Because he looks really mad all the time. So here's my question. Do you think Michael Shannon hates you after having worked with him on several different films? Are you still worried about him, whether he likes you or not? It's kind of a joke. No, it's not. (laughs) I think, one, I think he's warming up to me a little bit. Um, And I, I will say, I'm always worried that he might get mad at me. Yeah. You know? Like that, you know, 
you just you don't you don't know. Um, well, he just doesn't suffer fools. I mean, like it's you know you have to be on point. He does with him. not suffer fools. Yeah. But you know, I work with Sam Shepard too, and he doesn't suffer fools. <laughs> so you know, um, the the thing with Mike is one, he and we were talking about you know his ability to memorize lines and everything else. He is he's nobody's dummy. Like he knows exactly what he's doing, yeah. and he knows exactly the effect that he's having on the people around him. Yeah. So he is he he's doing all of this for a reason. Um, and from our perspective, we just kind of sync up. You know, the stuff I write, he just kind of has an understanding of, yeah. um, and. We just don't bullshit very much. It, it, it is very, uh, and I, li- I like sitting around and talking with actors about their backstory because I wrote all this stuff, so I can talk about that for days. Um, but he doesn't need any of that. I don't think I've ever seen him with a script in his hand, and he knows the scripts better than I do. You know, um, he he just does the work, and and he really tries to do the thing that all actors say they're doing, which is. He just tries to sit there and think about what he needs in the moment and and listen to what's going on. And um, whenever he talks about acting, he, he talks about it that simply. It's not until you look at the dailies that you're just like, holy crap. you know. I mean, what he's doing in this movie, I think, is, is remarkable. Um, and I just, what I was so struck by is his ability to convey warmth and sweetness with this kid. Um, yeah, that happened in Take Shelter too, though. I, you know, because I didn't write Take Shelter for him, as dumb as that sounds. But the, um, I was on the phone with him, and we we're kind of talking it out. And he had a daughter. He has a daughter. Um, she was younger then, and and I heard him. Well, Nichols, okay, yeah. Hey, baby, what are you doing? And like, I heard this shift in his voice, and I immediately it was it, it just was so obvious. Yeah. Um, that that's something that he could do um, because that's a really delicate role. You know, everybody in take shelter thinks he's going to, you know, when's he going to pick up the hatchet and hit him in the head. And like, I never wrote it that way. You know, there's, he never does anything in that film to make you think he's going to hurt his family. Quite the opposite actually. Um, but that just becomes this kind of beneficial byproduct of, of Michael Shannon that he, 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 he gives you this question about ah, maybe you could but but he, he's not like that at all you know and and this is even more pure than than take shelter i mean there's no character arc for this character yeah. you know um he's just devoted from the beginning to the end and yeah and he just plays that over and over and over again um i want to ask you i want to ask you one more question about that but first i want to ask you about the score which i thought was so remarkable um who did it Yep, a guy named David Wingo. Okay, uh, yeah, and he's, he's been working great. with me since uh, Take Shelter. I met him through David Gordon Green, mm-hmm. another f- friend of ours, um, and he had done the score for George Washington with another guy, and had been doing. I think he did Snow Angels and um, all the Real Girls. So he had kind of been cutting his teeth uh, with David, but uh, Take Shelter was the first film we worked on together. But this was really up his alley, you know, um, when. When I first started talking about it, you know, we were talking about Tangerine Dream scores and and um, and John Carpenter. And midway through production, he sent me that theme. He was like, "What do you think about this?" And and I just listened to it every day on the way to work because it's. So I mean, it's. Yeah, it, I, I, um, I loved it. I loved it immediately because it felt like it was evocative of everything we loved, but at the same time, felt like it it could be a new score. Um, it didn't feel just totally retread. Um, which you, which gets tricky when you start using the synth stuff. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he is, um, he's a like, I mean, there's these handful of people, you know, my producers, um, Brian Cavanaugh Jones and Sarah Green, but my cinematographer, Adam Stone, my production designer, Chad Keith, David Wingo, and my editor, Julie Monroe, like they've been with me now. And like they, they define how these films feel, I think, as much as I do, for sure. Um, I think that's, kind of incredible because to be able to work with this same group of collaborators and and to keep kind of um growing together is 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 remarkable are you is that they're just you're locked with them like it's always yeah i mean with warner brothers that was the same 
Warner Bros. was great. There was no, never any question about it. But, yeah, had they said, look, you can have Mike Shannon, you can have $19 million, whatever it is, um, you, but you can't have your, what, go get a, go get a big time cinematographer. Yeah, I would have just had to leave. Yeah. And, and I'm, it's not me puffing my chest out and saying how cool I am. It's because I, I it's how much I lean on these people, you know, and we have, we've, we've developed together. Um, and I think we're all getting better. Uh, I really genuinely think we're going to have it figured out here in, <laughs> in a couple years. Um, so let me tell you my interpretation of as a new father and you tell me if I'm wrong or don't or tell me don't don't analyze it so to me there's something about letting go right I, I think yes. a little bit um and and something about you know being just devoted and not judging and then just kind of letting go and there are bigger forces at work. I mean, that's what I felt from the end. It's like at some point I'm going to, my little six month old, I'm going to have to, he's going to be, you know, and I'm going to have to let him go, which is yes. sad. And which I think is a very sophisticated um, thing to, to be talking about in a movie that's about aliens or right. whatever. And like, so do you, is it, is, is, is there a thesis in your mind? Does there need to be, is 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 it like is it cool that I have this interpretation that may I not be valid? I think it's a great interpretation. I think it's totally fair. Uh, there's an emotion uh, at the heart of these things. So, I think my stated goal as a director or as a storyteller um, is to transfer an emotion to the audience. I think that's far more important than plot. I think it's far more important than character arc. Um, I think, I think I had a feeling. Um, when my son had this seizure that I wanted to share with people. I had a feeling when Sandy Hook happened that I still haven't gotten over. And it is palpable. And you all know, like the gauntlet of filmmaking is is so treacherous and so tough to get. You have to find a feeling that's that's palpable enough to make it through all these different phases and still be there when all the crap is done. and. And to me, what you're talking about, yes, it's the natural progression of parenthood to let your children go. You just hope they leave for college, and and that's how that works. <laughs> but what it points out is this, this, it's a beautiful tragedy, and that's what parenthood is to me. For right now. My son's five now, and it's evolving. But, like, isn't it beautiful that that they leave us. Isn't that what makes us love them so much? But it's still so sad. Yeah. It's just, uh, that's what it is. I'm in a constant state of happiness and sadness. Um, and that, and that's a really, that's much, that's a much more difficult thing than what was at the heart of Take Shelter. I think Take Shelter, in a lot of ways, might be a more successful film simply because the, I, that emotional idea was so much clearer. Here, it's very hard for me to even, you know, um, explain it. Right. But I think you feel it. Um, I know I feel it, and I wanted people to feel it. And that's, and that's all I that's all I care about. Like when the kid jumps out of the car at the end, and Mike Shannon betrays himself and calls back after him. Like that's it. That's the whole movie for me. Um, in fact, there was one journalist that told me I should have ended the movie there. Um, I told her she was wrong. But the, um, but you know that. That's what that's what it is. It's this weird, just duality of of love and not, and not fear, but love and sadness. That's what parenthood is. And that's what I was going for. Um, there's a real minimalism to that scene as well, you know. And and I mean, to a lot of the movie, it's very sparse. The dialogue and stuff like that is that. Um, obviously, that's that's a that's a choice. But did you ever think to milk that moment more? Did you ever think to? I'm just curious. Yeah, um, I mean, we, we we worked on the edit of that um, pretty specifically, but it was always written like that. And in fact, I remember Kirsten; she was like, "It's so mean that I'm pulling him away." I was like, "But you have to pull him away. Uh, you have to pull him away, uh, and it has to happen quickly um, because because that's what's going to be so beautiful about it. Um, if he if he hung out and got to say goodbye, that doesn't work. And so um, I think though when it comes to the minimalist dialogue, that's actually, 
that comes from a whole other part of my evolution as a as a writer. Um, I my first film, Shotgun Stories. Mike Shannon has this wound in his back with these shotgun pellets that have grown over and healed over, and all these different characters throughout the film give an explanation for why they think that happened. And you never really know. And the night before I sent the script to Mike Shannon for the first time, I just kept working on this one monologue where his brother explains it to the audience. And it was terrible. It was the worst thing ever. And um, I deleted it. And the script immediately got better because um, there was no reason for that character to be saying that in that scene. It was, it was blatant exposition. And, I felt so compelled, though, because the story was so good about how he got shot. It meant so much. Surely people need that. But they don't. They don't. In fact, I I would venture to say they, they prefer not having it. Now, this film is that experiment gone uh, <clears throat> to an extreme, uh, possibly too far. But I think... I think what that experiment kind of taught me about writing is to treat dialogue just like action. So you have lines of action, lines of dialogue, lines of action or behavior. A character walks across the room. He sits down. Lines of dialogue should just be behavior. Um, they are not a device for us to get story through and just relieve yourself of that. Just take that out of the equation. And if you're doing it, stop it. Um, and what happens from that is it really forces you, especially in the in the writing stage, to come up with situations that demand the exposition. You know, there's exposition in the film. Like, Joel's character tells Kirsten his entire backstory. But that's because that felt like she would come out and ask about who this man was. And she didn't know. So that, I'm fine with. So it's not that, that you can't have exposition. It just, you have to challenge yourself, I think, to to make it spring naturally out of the behavior of the characters within the scenes. Um, and that's really where this kind of style comes from. And I'm still working on it. I'm still, I'm still, you know, working on the calculation. I don't think I got it a hundred percent right in this one, to be honest, but, um, but there are lots of places where I, I think I got it right. Well, I think it's a fantastic calibration. Ah, thank you. And, uh, on that note, thank you so much. Thank man. you guys. I'm flattered to be here. Thank you everyone. Have a great Sunday night. <laughs>